Greek literary epigrams reflect self <coughs> self-consciously on the process of reading. <coughs> As Michael Squire says, they can <coughs> already they can present an ekphrasis of a text as well as an image, a description of reading as well as of viewing. Although, of course, they often stretch the description with wit or irony. My subject is reading when figured as the reading of an inscription. For this reason, but also because I'm a newcomer to literary epigram, I had to economize, and therefore I limit myself mainly to book six and to a lesser degree seven of the anthology. I set the stage with illustrative representations of reading inscriptions, although Doris Meyer and others have examined these, including Heraclitus <clears throat> I. In the second distich, the speaker suggests to a wayfarer that they decipher the writing and see whose bare bones the stone says it protects. Then comes Aretemius' epitaph. The poem is less an imitation of an inscription than a representation of one being read out by persons lending their voices to Aretemius. Callimachus <coughs> 40 represents reading that progresses in fits and starts. The passerby reads the name Timanoe, interrogates the text, answers with three other inscribed proper nouns, and responds emotionally. The process was no doubt imagined as vocal, a dialogue of a reader with herself. Menophila's inscribed dialogue gives us two distinct voices. One asks, who is she? The other answers by quoting the heading. The letters indicate Menophila. The dialogue then turns to symbols on the stone, as in dialogic uh, poems representing interaction with the monument as sol <coughs> solving a riddle. Viewing rather than reading is normally represented, but a kind of reading appears in Alcaeus 16, where the speaker makes two attempts to interpret the puzzling phi-phi. Some poems refer to the physicality of reading, in Posidippus 104, if we accept the restoration, learning more about the deceased requires the addressee to take a step further, as if to read an inscription in smaller letters or engraved elsewhere on the monument. Such literary representations of reading surely say something about reading actual inscriptions. But what? Peter Bing has argued that reading inscribed epigrams became common, if ever, only in the Hellenistic period, thanks in part to the popularity of literary epigram. I have argued that archaic and classical epigrams were read at least often enough that people kept putting them up. To a degree, Peter and I have talked past each other. He emphasizes the lack of pre-Hellenistic literary accounts of reading inscriptions. Even inscribed epigrams may not mention uh, reading explicitly until the third century as here. I emphasize the physical context of earlier inscriptions, layouts that attracted and guided reading, wording that framed viewers' likely responses, and groups of epigrams encouraging cross-referencing. And on that last point, Peter and I are coming closer together. One other way to nudge the conversation forward is to suggest that literary epigrams' representations tell us something about pre-Hellenistic epigraphic reading. I do not deny that literary epigrammatists reflect both epigraphic reading of their own day and the reading of inscriptions and paper collections. Nevertheless, I put great stock in certain features common to epigrams of all periods, namely projections of reading and viewing. <clears throat> My goal today is to illustrate how, in many literary and some later inscribed epigrams, such features appear in 
or in contexts containing representations of reading. The projections fit, guide, or problematize the circumstances of reading, or rather the mental creation of reading an inscription while viewing a monument. Earlier inscriptional epigram lacks explicit representations of reading, but projections of it abound. I see no reason to deny that these projections worked in readings of earlier inscribed epigram in something like the way formally comparable projections are imagined as working in literary epigram. I discuss two types of projection. First, Dexis designed to fit a speech situation generated by reading, and second, description of the inscribed object intended to fit or guide viewers' responses, thus a projection of reading that complements viewing. Epigrams project reading as speech, which it was since most, epigram or most reading was vocal. Hellenistic and later texts make that explicit, as in Antipholus 21. As usual, I think, I'm finding, Callimachus is a lot more fun. If the god forgets, the tablet says it will bear witness. Earlier inscribed epigram uh, was not explicit. The opening of CEG 429 is precocious. However, most are marked dictically to fit or guide a speech situation in which readers played various roles, speaking in their own or another voice. Literary epigrams exploit that dexis, sometimes within dramatizations of reading inscriptions. I illustrate with the ich rede and dialogue epigram. The first person applied to the inscribed object is epigraphically common and old. Readers lent their voices to the statue, but their role playing was deictic shorthand for identifying an object immediately present without connotation of life or mind. Literary epigram, however, moves in that direction. In Callimachus 26, the tragic masks dedicator gave me but now I hang here yawning through pupils' recitations. Such poems derive charm from, the ins from an inscriptional dexis that works as intended to fit a speech situation, but does so hyper-realistically as readers channel a vivid personality in imaginary objects. Callimachus 25 edges closer to a representation of reading. The rooster's utterance, the whole poem, contains what inscriptions must. Dedicator's name and family, reason for offering, object's identity, divine recipient. But as Doris Meyer notes, Callimachus problematizes such information gained from reading. The bronze may speak, that is, we may read its inscription, but it underlines, rather than is normal, ignores its inanimate status. Reading only mouths words, the dedicator says, and in his absence, no real witness can verify their truth. I don't know. Dialogue epigram originated from joining the first person to another old deictic habit, second person addressed to a passerby, God, or someone else. But here, two voices speak. Typically, a passerby asks questions, and the monument or represented figure answers with epigraphic language. Implicitly, the answers represent an inscription being read, but some poems are more explicit. Callimachus 22 gives us the monument's voice, sounding very epigraphic, and the gods, with hilarious results. Heracles breaks in as if impatiently interrupting a plodding reader with questions that would be answered if he allowed the reading to continue. And there's more humor. A Dexi prayer, accept the gift, is common in de uh, dedications. I've argued elsewhere that reading inscribed Dexi could be perceived 
as a religiously successful reperformance of dedicatory ritual. And literary epigrammatists reflect that idea. Posidippus 38, again, if we accept the restoration, includes Dexai in a quotation from the original rite. Callimachus 22 seems to be moving toward a prayer, perhaps like that in 21. But Heracles anticipates the reader's Dexai with Dechamai in his haste to grab a new club. In effect, 22 represents an interaction between a reader and God, like that projected, minus the irony, in old dedicatory epigrams with Ishweda and secondary, second person prayers. Through description, epigrams project reading that complements viewing. Such projections identify or describe the object and reasons for its display. They prompt or categorize responses to it, or they otherwise explain it. All this is ekphrasis defined broadly, as John Brusk does, to, to encompass more than the full descriptions and responses in later inscribed and literary epigram. Myron's heifer looks like it's going to move. In earlier epigram, description is compact and formulaic, but it jives with viewers' projected responses. Epitaphs elicit pity verbally, for example, but they can coordinate that response with one generated by viewing, as in CEG 51. I lament as I gaze on this sema. Did such readings occur? Description in later epigram typically facilitates the representation of viewing, but many of these texts also highlight reading. I do not believe this association of reading viewing and description was a Hellenistic invention. I illustrate with dialogue and list epigrams. Menophila's epitaph, as we saw, begins with a dialogic representation of reading. A curious viewer asks, who is she? And is answered, the muse's letters indicate Menophila. Then comes a dialogic representation of viewing. Why is there carved on the stele and so forth, followed by the answers and a response? Dialogue as ekphrastic method, in Irmgard Mainline Robert's phrase, is common in literary epigram. And reading is sometimes part of the dialogue, as also in Posidippus 142. The statue answers the viewer's first two questions, it seems from an inscribed signature. All remaining questions and answers save the last concern iconography. In Meleager 122, the viewer carries on the iconographic dialogue with himself, but guessing the identity of the deceased ends in the last distich. The stone sings the name Antipater, another epigraphic quotation. Descriptive features in literary dedicatory epigrams often explain what an object is or how it was used. Common among explanatory epigrams in Anthology 6 are lists of multiple offerings dedicated as a group. Leonidas 7 illustrates the type in which a list splits dedicatory information. A comparable split appears in Antipater's inscribed epitaph from Delos. Dedication and prayer are separated by a list of items with con comments on their form, material, and use. Werner Paik called attention to the debt of list poems to inscribed temple inventories, and the Delos inventories show how right he was. Inventories appearing in groups were sometimes dedicated together, as confirmed by information copied from inscriptions. I'll be running through these fairly quickly, but they're on the handout. Specific items in inventories also turn up in epigrams. 
Although these distaffs and spindles are silver, we can compare epigrams such as Arceus 8. Inventories regularly make quantitative comments. They specify numbers, as Leonidas 34 does, and size, as in Leonidas 40. Also, material, as does Antipater's inscription. Finally, Inventories comment on condition, which becomes part of the fun in epigrams. In some epigrams, Ares rejects shiny new arms and armor. So Nasalki VI and other poems point to damage acquired in battle. Poeticized inventories, just as iconographic parts of dialogue epigrams, enable readers to envisage objects or to imagine a viewing of them. Two features of poetic lists not found in inventories confirm this. First is colorful, descriptive vocabulary. At Leonidas 8, a carpenter's file is toothed. His hammer strikes on both sides. His ruler is stained with miltos. His ax is handled, heavy, prettiness of his craft. Second are deictic markers. These tools, the hammer nearby, this axe, these four torres. Our mind's eye follows the text as it points now to this item, now to that one. As dialogue epigrams can have a separate part that mimics reading, something outside the lists enables these poems readers to imagine or enact readings of inscriptions. I refer to the parts that, in fact, echo inscriptions. Dedicator, verb, recipient uh, for dedicate, or, sorry, reason for dedicating, recipient, and often prayers. My point is clearest in the many poems, 37 in Anthology 6, where these elements gather at the end, after the list. Readers of Leonidas 52 mimic the way people encountered inscribed dedications. The object or whole monument was the eye-catching thing. It attracted passers-by before they could read an inscription. They would approach more closely, pick out visual details, and begin assigning meaning. Leonidas starts in medias res. We are already close enough to take in the group of modest objects from which point the poem forces us to complete the visual process. Our mental gaze stops at each item. We note its appearance, long poles, sharp trident, or we imagine its function, a hook easily gulped down, or its history, this wheel, a well-designed invention of Netzman. Viewing, though, leaves unanswered the questions imagined in dialogic evocations of reading. Who dedicated? To whom? Why? In encountering a real dedication, people would move close enough to satisfy their curiosity by reading the inscription after viewing was underway. In reading uh, Leonidas 52, that curiosity is satisfied after the list in the final distinct. Fisherman, Diophantos, to the lord of his craft upon retirement. After a longer list, the dedication in Antipater 54 includes the dedicator's full identity. Readers of such epigrams mimic two processes, viewing groups of objects first, then reading dedicatory inscriptions. Non-list epigrams can work sim uh, similarly, as we saw in Meleager 122. Viewing is enacted in the iconographic dialogue. Inscribed Antipater comes at the end. And people did experience this dual process in cemeteries, sanctuaries, and agoras. Herodas's fourth Mimiambus narrates the kind of scene literary epigrams brought to life in their readers' minds. A pair of women approach and admire dedicated statues. One, her curiosity piqued, asks, what artist made this stone and who is the dedicator? 
her companion answers with the names which she reads or paraphrases from an inscription. Don't you see the letters there on the base? Earlier literature may lack such descriptions, but we can put some faith in reconstructions of archaic and classical Greeks doing bodily what readers uh, of lisps and ekphrastic dialogues and literary epigrams do mentally. Imagine two people on the Athenian Acropolis shortly before Xerxes' invasion. As they pass through the Propylia, the canyon between the old temple and the rising pre-Parthenon focused their gaze on Callimachus's dedication. The Nike stood atop a three-meter <coughs> column placed at the highest point on the Acropolis rock. It would draw our visitors closer and closer, finally to this position, from which they looked directly into Nike's face and enjoyed the fullest view of her running figure. Viewers standing there also occupied the best spot for reading the pair of epigrams cascading in two crimson rows down from Nike's central axis. I believe a lot of them did read, and literary epigram may support that belief. Projections of reading and Hellenistic and later epigram are formally related to old epigraphic ones, such as the restored me and the description of Nike in the first Callimachus epigram. Literary projections to some extent work as intended in contexts that include representations of reading inscriptions while viewing inscribed objects. The poets had no direct access to encounters with monuments <coughs> hundreds of years before their own day. But the epigraphic forms they reflect are old, and I see no reason to deny that the functions the poets associate with those forms also had an earlier history. Thank you.